George and go. This is what we do and why we do it, baby. We roll Covering MMA from all over the world, this is the premier stop for all your combat sports needs. MMA Junkie Radio, the only show broadcasting live from the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino in the fight capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada. The lights are on and the mics are hot. It's time to get your MMA fix, junkies. Take it away, Big John. Gorgeous George and Goes, are you ready? Junkie Nation, are you ready? Well, let's get it on. Yeah, man, let's get it on. What's up? Junkie Nation, it's the MMA Junkie Radio Show, live from the Race and Sportsbook here at the La- uh, Mandalay, excuse me. <laughs> Mandalay Bay Race and Sportsbook. I'm your host, Gorgeous George. With me, as always, is the Devious and Dashly Goes, our East co host. Back East producing Jumbo Josh, starting things off on deck. Andre the Giant, what's up? What up? Not much. What is? Chilling. Chilling like a villain. Looking forward to some of these games. Looking forward to doing some MMA Junkie Radio on a Thursday, May 16th. Two days away from UFC on ESPN Plus 10. Headlined by Rafael Dos Anjos and Kevin Lee. Your boys will be back on the Sportscaster, by the way. We'll talk more about that uh, in a bit. On today's show, we got two guests headed your way. Derek Krantz from PFL. He's going to be fighting next Thursday, a week from today, actually. And uh, we also have Steven Seiler. Oh, excuse me. I got that backwards. Steven Seiler fights a week from Thursday, and Derek Krantz fights on Saturday. He's the guy that's slipping in for uh, Neil Magny, who was flagged by a potential anti-doping violation. You're going through the motions right now, Courtesy of right? USADA, yeah. yeah. Well, you know what's going to happen is he's going to say, hell no, that wasn't me. Obtained a supplement, blah, blah, blah. There's not hey, too man, many. man, a lot of those come back, though. There's not too many, like, TJ Dillashaw that goes, man, I was dumb, huh? Yeah. And then they do that uh, their little deal. But His was impossible, though, right? TJ's? Yeah, he had to come out and say he was, he was dumb. Yeah, pretty much. So, yeah, Neil Magny's out of his fight versus Vicente Luque. And it sucks for Luque because Luque's, like, literally 7-1 and one in the UFC. And we all know he's got really good potential. But he needs that skin on the wall so that when you look on the wall, you go, you beat him? Mm-hmm. Ooh, you're for real. All right, now what? He doesn't have that yet. Magny would have helped. Magny's not top five, but Magny's been probably a top ten guy for a while. He's got some other issues that need to be sorted out, allegedly. All right, so Derek Krantz is stepping in, and we'll talk a little bit more about the card today. Tomorrow when Dan Tom's here, we'll do some previewing and some uh, picks. UFC's in Rochester, so that's a pretty big deal for their continual support of the state of New York. Remember, that's a state, one of the last states that said, all right, MMA, do your thing here. I think MMA was either the last or the second to the last, and the UFC invested a lot of money, but the UFC has held their, held true to their word, and they've gone back to many cities in New York, including multiple visits to Brooklyn and Manhattan for huge, huge cards, but they are spreading the love throughout the state. At the cost of us. Thanks a lot, Josh. I think it cost us probably uh, about a pay-per-view per year, yeah. I think it did. I didn't think it was at all. Because remember, back in the day, I used to walk to the school and five miles of snow each way. And I'm just kidding. We used to have Super Bowl Saturday. Memorial. Memorial Day. Fourth of July. Labor Day. And end of the year. And even then, we'd still sometimes get a surprise card on it somewhere in October or November. Well, Memorial Day is around the corner. And guess what? We're off. I can already tell you that right now. So, we would push back usually and say, well, how can we be off? we got to recap the so-and-so card. There is no card. Well, no major pay-per-view in the UFC. So, that's been gone. And the Super Bowl one's been gone for a while, at least five years since I think we've done one of those. And what sucked is a lot of those were at Mandalay Bay. I think it would have gone anyway with the T-Mobile. The T-Mobile just disrupted everything. Uh, Labor Day has really been inconsistent as well. You can definitely count on International Fight Week. End of the year, both of those being in Las Vegas. And then what the UFC seems to do is give us something in March and something in October. So basically we become one per quarter versus one uh, versus five or six times per year. So I think it cost us one or two, and I think New York's the main culprit. Canada used to be the main culprit. Canada, then you could, Australia, then Canada Sweden, would blame Brazil, Mexico, right? Brazil, yeah. And then... Yeah, Canada would blame Brazil, and then who 
who blamed Australia? Brazil? No, because Brazil's first visit was 2011. It just blew up then. Canada was before that. Then Mexico came along. Australia's been popping. So has Sweden. I keep mm -hmm. saying Sweden, but I thought Mexico would be more on the regular. I really thought it was going to well, be. Well, we need that big Mexican-born star to hold the strap. Mm -hmm. Then I think it's on. But until that happens, but can you imagine if the Philippines got one of those? Ooh, Ireland got theirs, think but they've the only gone back there. to Ireland just a handful of times. They, Connor had you know the incredible run that he had, and he just didn't have. I guess he he needed a Scotty Pippen to his Jordan, mm -hmm. maybe you know, so that when he wasn't fighting, the other guy was. He hasn't really had that. We've had Irish fighters, but nothing with the the measure of success that Conor McGregor's had. All right, so you know who the guests are, and now let me give you some information vital to the show. You can call in and participate in the show by calling 877-FIGHT-93, 877-344-4893. You can hit us up on Twitter, at MMA on Series 6 m We have a couple pockets before these interviews uh, hit us and in between the interviews. So at any point in time, if you, if you holler at us, we will do our best to get you in. In fact, I guarantee you'll get in. Let's start off with some big news here. 48 hours ago, I think we came off, we talked a little bit about Anderson Silva. He lost to Jared Cannonier. He got kicked in the knee a couple times. And after the third or fourth, it buckled. And he went down and he was in pain. But it wasn't like as severe as the leg break he suffered to Chris Weidman. Hell no. But it was still enough to end the fight. Jared Cannonier wins. He's now 2-0 as a middleweight. Anderson Silva, we all wonder, well, how serious was it? Because this... Could this be it? And it sounded like, no, no, it's not it. I still have a few more fights on my contract. I just got to heal up from this. You'll see me soon. 48 hours later, I log on to MMA Junkie. The title of this article is, Anderson Silva expresses serious doubts about fighting after UFC 237. Seems like he's had a chance to reflect, maybe, and really give it some serious thought. Now he's starting to make some of the points that we were making. He's starting to sound more like we did the other day. Yeah. Now, Anderson Silva does have, we always talk about life after fighting. If you have something set up, it's a lot easier to transition. Otherwise, you want to make sure you can get as many of those bags of money as you can. It's like robbing a bank. The cops are coming. All right, let's go to the safe. We usually don't go to the safe. But come on, this, you know you're, this is the last one. You go on your surfing trip, and then you don't come back till the next season, right? <laughs> next rob, bank robbing season. I'm going off point break, but you know what I mean. You hear the sirens, but you know you have a certain amount of time to get out of there, but you see a bag of money, and you have to decide, that takes me a second and a half to go back five steps, grab it, and take it with me. But can, in those three seconds, did those cops who are flying 80 miles an hour, are they that much closer to you? know, you got to decide. And that's what Anderson Silva's doing. He's not necessarily robbing, but on the way out, he's trying to take as many bags of money as he can because he knows he's not – going to suffer a really serious injury. This, though the worst has already been past him. Yeah. This is a really safe Doesn't sport. He trains. When he trains, people punch him in the face. I'm sure he's been knocked out in training. In fact, I know he has. And, But this is in front of an audience where he gets paid a lot of money. So I, th I really think that's what it is, goes. It's just these guys are trying to scoop up bags of money as they run out and get in the getaway car. Anderson Silva is 44 years of age. And he's one of the greatest bank robbers ever. But can he do one more heist or two and then that's it? I don't know. That's I what, think he can. That's what he's thinking. However, let me read you what he posted on Instagram. And then you, of the psychology degree, can tell me exactly if he's, well, what he's thinking. You ready? Let's do it. He says, hello, everyone. I'm constantly ask, asking myself, what are each of us doing on this planet? If life is just about living for the sake of living the hours and minutes to the maximum, that is definitely not my motto. I have full conviction that there is a bigger meaning in everything that we live and do here. Life in this terrestrial plane has a bigger meaning than just living for the sake of living. I believe it's a constant search for evolution. In these four days, after yet another unsuccessful mission, I'm questioning whether I should or not keep training, dedicating myself, overcoming injuries, pain, etc. I wonder how many people are giving me the signal of that rotating hand. Like, come on, mm -hmm. come on. Wrap it up. Get to it. Yeah, wrap it up. But I'll continue. I ask myself always, is the love that I feel for my sport consuming my mind and my body to the point that I can no longer continue? Anyway, 
everything I've always done was to be a good soldier in my battlefield, the most well-trained, the most disciplined, and ready to die for my mission. Because my love for my job has always talked and still talks louder. I am totally certain that I can do all this another 1,000 times, but the last four days with pain and uncertainty, which are not new in my everyday life, are consuming more than before. Actually, my heart and my warrior mind confuse me to the point of creating doubts. On the one hand, I realize I'm not, and I don't need to be perfect. How much this search has brought me good things and bad things over the years. It's almost done. Why did I decide to tell you what I'm feeling? Because I believe that many of you who follow me like and admire my work. And on the other hand, I'm always trying to bring positive messages and motivation to all of you. Guys, what we really must do is take in all the opportunities that life, gi life gives us to improve ourselves as people. Therefore, always remember that failures are your best teachers and that it's in the hard moments that people need to find reasons to keep going forward. Our actions, especially when we need to overcome ourselves, make us better people. Our ability to resist and stay on path is what makes us special people. I think he's looking for... For one, I could tell you right now, I think he's coming back based on what he said. Oh. I really do. I think what that is, is, and I'm not trying to disparage him in any way. People do this all the time. I think he just wants a pat on the back. Just uh, come on, Anderson. You're the best. You'll always be the best. I think he's trying to gauge what the reaction is from his fans. Like and a teenage girl that posts on Instagram. A little bit. going back to see how many likes there are. Yeah, so it's like her in a bikini, and she's like, look at the Luxor behind me. And she knows damn well nobody's looking at the Luxor. I think he just wants to see what people's reactions are. But you think news. he still I think has something in the, in the tank? Yeah. All right. I ask you again, do you want to see him fight again? I don't mind. As a fan, I don't mind watching him. Business-wise, I don't know if that still makes sense for the UFC. But I, I wouldn't mind watching him. I, I would actually show interest in watching him fight somewhere else and matching up against some of these like other the winner fighters. of Chael and Leoto like if, if you heard that they signed him and that he was going to fight the winner of Chael and Leoto you'd be down if if he would fight Leoto yeah um yeah I'd be okay with it you know who more I, I would want to see him fight in one championship and wa watch him fight Vitor I'd do something like that mm. or go up Actually, and, go up and fight Tito Musasi is the actual champion over there yeah well, okay, so why does that attract you, I guess, as a fan? That Yeah, I'll watch him fight Vitor or Tito. Like because I, I don't really, there's nothing to it for me to watch him put someone else over. Because I can tell you right now, if he fights Tito, usually, let's say that fight's made, and usually if somebody goes, hey, man, on Saturday, I got two tickets, want to go, blah, 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 fill in the blank. Usually I'm going, no, man, I can't. The fight's now usually... It's my polite way of saying I didn't want to go to your concert anyway. But no, really, it's my work. It's my job. you got to have a good reason for me to skip that. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't need much of a reason for me to skip Anderson versus Tito. Like, Really? I would go see that. Especially if you're getting me to pay for it. I'm not going to pay Man, for it. Man, when I hear both the songs and all that, I'd be so into it. But there's just like the stakes no. aren't there. Like, But it's not there for both of them. I know. I don't know. There's if no he wins if they in had the bad UFC blood, against perhaps. somebody. If they had bad blood, perhaps. But the fact that there's no bad blood. Well, he's got it with Vitor. They're, they're, well, I was going off Tito. All right, Vitor. Vitor in one championship. Yeah, you write that big kick for Vitor. How many times does he have to see that? Every time there's a UFC I'd have to put a, I'd have to put a bet on it. I, I could sleep through that. Really? Hmm. Other than like, hey, I know on Monday I got to come in here and talk about it. I don't feel like it's up. Tito Chuck. I feel like it's on a notch above that. It's better than that. All right. Well, if you want to chime in, it's 877-FIGHT-93, 877-344-4093. In fact, Mike in Connecticut wants to chime in. What's up, Mike? How you doing? Hey, how's it going, guys? Good, man. Got one thing I got to say first before I chime in. You guys are so much better than Luke Thomas. Oh. <laughs> you don't have to respond. I know he's your com comrade and all that <laughs> stuff. So much better. Well, thank you. Uh, we appreciate that. Second thing, yeah, second thing is I think I agree 100% that this is a cry for attention. And not to, like, downplay it because he is hurt and 
his legs seem to be made of glass. But I think he'll come back, and this is, yes, absolutely a way to see who's supporting him and who's behind him. And then aside from that, I think he needs to retire because there's only so much damage he can take, and the more damage he takes, the more losses he, he's going to rack up. Retire on top, man. That's how I feel. Okay. Thank you for the call. You know the thing I'll, is? I'll, I'll uh, hang up and chime in. All right. Thank you, sir. I, I feel like um, that time passed to retire on top. Yeah. I really feel like these last couple losses have, have damaged him a little bit. So now where he's at the point where he's kind of lost that, like every time we say the goats, we bring up his name because we're so used. he gets eliminated quickly. So does and Penn, I, and yeah. I think he realizes that. So I think he kind of passed that time. And now he's just, it's just all about paper, mm-hmm. making money. So yeah, I firmly believe that too. He can be competitive, but uh, there's no way he's going to put that together for three, four fights, five fights, whatever it takes in the UFC. If he had a run in the UFC and pride, where they treated him with respect and he was given a lot of you know, benefits when he was at the top, then I think he doesn't mind putting some of these young guys over, giving them an opportunity. If they went off his name, okay. But a lot of fighters, I mean, they are bitter, and that's why they're cashing and grabbing those last money bags. And they leave the sport, and you don't hear too much about them or whatever. I look at like a guy like Michael Bisping. He's retired. He loves the UFC. He won't miss the UFC. It's not just because they – not them, but because ESPN or Fox or anybody used to pay them. He he really loved doing it. The right opportunity came. And so he doesn't leave with as much of a, of a bitter taste in his mouth. But I think Anderson was treated well, and I think that's why some of these will sting. But I think he can still, the, the, the martial artist in him, the values that he has, probably knows, okay, I'm not performing at my best, and maybe I have other opportunities. You know, that, 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 Again, that's hard to defy. Because I still feel like the dollar is what makes people tick, especially as you get older. You want to make sure, wow, did I make enough? Am I ever going to make this much more money than what I make by fighting you know, mixed martial arts and what, what, what these guys pay me? Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, I, I, I feel like he's not done, but I think like the next one could be it. Whereas before, if he said, I still got four fights on my contract, I put it. I probably would have thought to myself, yeah, he'll probably finish him out because he's not really getting thumped, per se, and knocked unconscious. That could benefit the UFC. If, if he comes out and he says that, I'm going to do it one more, but this is the last one, that's a ticket seller, I think. Think about a fight that See would make last sense one. for him. Think about a fight that would make sense for You're him. We'll talk about that when we come back. Oh. You're listening to MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 156. Also, we'll talk about Neil Magny and why he's out and why we'll be talking to Derek Krantz in about 15 minutes. And we'll be right back. Literally in two minutes.
Andre, what the hell's going on? <laughs> Sorry, this computer just crashed on me. I just rebooted it, and it kind of messed everything up. So, yeah. I, I will say this. That's probably as good as an excuse or a comeback you can get. Yeah. Right? Because <laughs> it really happened, man. But if that was his first time, I go, oh, that shit happens all the time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Potna. No, he's but got one he more this life. like a week ago? He's got this. This was his second life. Uh-huh. Now on the third one, you, you can torch him. No matter what happens. All right. I wouldn't be mad if Josh came up from behind and just put a pie in his face. <laughs> now nah, he was here when this computer crashed, so he knows the struggle. Would All you right. Would you take a pie in the face though, or was that Yo, excessive? Of course. George well, of course. owes a I'm pie in the to face to Melvin Gallard still. I do, but I, I, don't, I think we're years removed from that one. Yeah, you better remind him before you do that shit. Tonight at nine Eastern, the Portland Trailblazers look to even the series with the Golden State Warriors in Game Two of the Western Conference Finals. Enjoy all the thrilling play-by-play on NBA Radio, Series 207, XM86, and streaming on your phone and at home on Series XM connected devices and speakers. By the way, the Golden State Warriors are playing without Kevin Durant. He strained his calf in the third quarter of Game 6 versus the Houston Rockets. Right. No, Game 5 versus the Houston Rockets. That means they went into the fourth quarter... Without Kevin Durant. Now, if they went into the fourth quarter without Kevin Durant but a 20-point lead, I would not make this point. It was tied, goes. So the Rockets had to play the Golden State Warriors without Kevin Durant. And last year, they were competitive when they had Kevin Durant, and they didn't have Chris Paul. Instead, the Rockets lose that game and then go home a full game without the Warriors not having Kevin Durant and lose that. But I told you what the record so is. The Rockets those guys. are bye bye. Now Portland comes in hot off a series against Denver Nuggets. Yeah, they got some injuries too, but they just beat the Denver Nuggets. They go in the Golden State and they got waxed. Now it's game two. They need to win this game or that's over. Western Conference, what more do you want? You're catching the Warriors without Kevin Durant. I mean, enough already. Do something. The Warriors may be okay with just resting Durant. Until they figure out who wins between Toronto and, and uh, the Milwaukee Bucks. Mm-hmm. Anyway, just shaking my head over here. But you got to tip your hat to the Warriors because they're doing all this without Kevin Durant. and That's pretty amazing, honestly. Pretty amazing. All right, so Derek Krantz is going to join us in a few minutes. He's stepping in for Neil Magny. Neil Magny was forced out of his UFC fight night card, uh, fight, excuse me. He was in the co-main event against Vicente Luco, Luque. And the reason is because he got an email from USADA, you know, the whole alleged anti-doping violation. Let me read you what Neil Magny said. I, I just came here to read to people, like, apparently, today. But this is the easiest way to do it. This is what Neil Magny posted on his gram. At Neil Magny. No, at Neil underscore Magny 170. Luckily, I went to uh, private school, Andre, so I have no problem doing these reads. I can sound out the big words. Hey. As many of you know, <laughs> I had to withdraw from my scheduled bout against Vicente Luque on Saturday, May 18th. I want to apologize to him as I know how difficult it is to lose an opponent days out from a fight. Throughout my MMA career, I have been very transparent. I'm not afraid to admit when I am in the wrong. On Saturday, May 11th, 2019, I received an email from USADA stating that I've been flagged due to a, quote, out-of-competition drug test, end quote. The flag was due to a metabolite of the substance uh, dehydroxy LGD 4033. I have fully cooperated with USADA thus far to determine how this substance was found in my sample. I provided them on May 5th, 2019. I've always been an advocate of a strict uh, drug testing in the UFC, even to the extent of opting for my collected samples to be used for research purposes by USADA. I know without a doubt that I have done everything in accordance with the standards set by USADA. I have faith in USADA that the situation will be resolved in a timely manner and that I will be cleared of any wrongdoing. To all my fans and supporters, thank you. I assure you that I have not let you down. That's a pretty strong statement. And I don't know him personally, but I know that this is his first time. So you know what? I'm actually... I actually, like, if I were to comment on his gram, I'd just go, hey, let us know when this gets resolved. But I'm leaning more towards innocent versus guilty, whereas usually I raise my eyebrow and go, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, right. 
But for some reason, I, I, I take him at his word. It was the way he said it, the timing of it. He kind of won me over. When you yeah. read the headline, you go, ah, again, another one. And then when you read what he has to say, you kind of go, all right, all right. I'll, I'll be patient. I'll sit over here in the corner and, and see this out. You kind of won me over. Right. Yeah. So, anyway, that's kind of the update there. All right. Before the break, we were talking a little bit about Anderson Silva. And who do you think Anderson Silva goes should face if and when he was to come back? Uriah Hall. You know, it's not bad. Even though Hall's younger, y'all Hall has been through kind of a on and off, win, lose, win mm -hmm. a couple, lose type of run where he doesn't really disrupt what's happening at the top of the division, but yet he's still a big enough name, and he's also got a skill set where you know him and Silva would put on a show. So You have to give I, the public. I won't even bother, I guess, saying, oh, yeah, well, guess what I came up with because – that one's hard to top. I don't really want to see Diaz Part 2. Oh, hell no. We're not no. trying to get Hendo or Bisping out of retirement. I mean, you know, I, usually I would think about another older guy. If Vitor was around, maybe Vitor Part 2. But, yeah, no, I think you nailed it. Uriah Hall would be a good one. You have to give the public an option or a side of a fight where they think both guys can win. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not just a setup type fight. And... If you're Anderson Silva, that's probably what you want, right? The dude to stand right in front of you. That's Uriah Hall. That's all. That's him all day. He'd love to stand in front of you and bang. I think it's a good one. Yeah, you're right. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk to Derek Krantz, UFC welterweight, stepping in for Neil Magny as he faces Vicente Luque this Saturday, UFC on ESPN Plus 10. It's an ESPN 2 and ESPN Plus offering. We'll sort all that back when we come back and talk to Derek. Stay close.
And you get MMA Junkie Radio. Don't forget on Saturday, it's UFC on ESPN Plus 10. Your boy here and goes are going to be on the Sportscaster doing our thing like we have the past few weeks. We'll be watching along with you, Junkie Nation. So check out www.sportscaster.com forward slash MMA Junkie. We'll be calling the fights with you as you watch them. Kevin Lee, Rafael Dos Anjos at the top. Stepping in for Neil Magny is Derek Krantz. He'll be facing Vicente Luque. Now, Vicente Luque and Neil Magny was the co-main event, but this one is now slotted in the third fight of the night. And uh, But they're still on the main card, which is on ESPN+. Plus. The prelims are also on ESPN+. Plus. So there's no doubt. I don't care how much you resist. If you love MMA, you got to get ESPN Plus at this point because there's a lot of content on there. All right, let's get back to our guest. It's Derek Krantz. He joins us now on the hotline. What's up, Derek? How you doing? I'm doing good, guys. Thanks for having me on. All right, thanks for joining us here on MMA Junkie Radio. And before we get to your fight, you got to settle a bet for us. You ready? Okay. I feel like between now, well, when you were born, well, no, actually, the bet was sometime in his schoolyard days. So let's let's say something like first to high school goes. Is that good? Dude, I'll even give you kindergarten. All right, from kindergarten to high school, at some point, some dumbass kid in one of your classes called you ants in your pants crants. Go says no. We bet Chipotle over it. What's the answer? Yeah, that's a that's a negative Ghost Rider. Really? Thank no you. one called you ants in your pants crants. Nope. The pattern is full. He said it. No. Wow. Yeah. So you were like uh, you were D Rock since age five, and no one just no one budged <laughs> off that one. Well, I was, boy, I was I was biting cheeks off in kindergarten. Damn, Nobody who are you, Max me. Katie? <laughs> in kindergarten? <laughs> oh, so you you were the tough right. guy in the class, so no one came no one came at you then, huh? Uh, I grew up rough. I had to learn the hard way. You know what? That makes sense though, because in kindergarten, right. you're you're you still haven't really figured out how the world works. So injuries in kindergarten are way worse than later on. In right. Life. But that's where you, you pick up a chair and you just hit another kid because he took your your pudding cup or something. I so I, I I get that. But what I'm saying is my or, or take a rock and and bust a kid's eye open. And yeah. He gets like sixteen t- stitches. It doesn't did, matter. Did that really happen, D Rock? You threw a rock and and yeah, that happened. That happened in first grade. <laughs> All right, how did, well, oh man, I love street fight stories. I can't believe I'm asking for one from the first grade. But how did that go down? Oh man, uh, we were running out of the, on the the playground, and I saw a rock fly over my head. So I picked up the biggest one and threw it into a crowd of people and hit damn someone. Did you at least hit the guy that allegedly threw the one at you, the kid? No, I probably hit the softest kid in class. Oh, wow. wow. And what happened? He just got stitches uh, across his eyebrow or something like that or yeah. below the eye? Yeah. Yeah, I got expelled. Is that where D-Rock was born? <laughs> that's, I guess you could say that's where D-Rock was born. Wow. Uh, I, I like to give it credit to my fans. I got to yeah. give this I got to give this intel to Ben Folks, who judges the worst, the best and the worst nicknames on every card, I believe. And if he hears about this, he won't grade D-Rock. Yeah, uh, as, as stern as he as he would have, but you, let me go back to ants in yeah. your pants. Ants in your pants is so silly that I could see like his pop Warner coach. Come on, hurry up, ants in your what you got? Ants in your pants, Krantz. I could see a coach saying it. I could see a little girl saying it. It didn't just have to be a little boy that was scared to stand up to D Rock. It could have been anybody. Come on, it's it's too no. easy. Ants you, in you know your pants, Krantz. I was so sure. I don't, I, I don't remember. You're costing me Chipotle you, here, D Rock. Think I'm about it. Gonna get blasted with it now. Dude, he's gonna throw a <laughs> rock at you. Look, dude, this is why I was so confident. Cause we're of a different era, right? And ants in your pants was oh, more man. your era yeah. and a little bit of mine. It was played out by the time he came around. Yeah. Well, he's nine years younger than you and eighteen years younger than me. So maybe you're right. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. Well, before you hang up on us, you're probably thinking, "Is this fucking romper room radio or what?" No, this is MMA <laughs> Junkie Radio, and we're anxious to talk to you, Derek. Uh, hey, look, first of all, tip of the hat, you're stepping in on short notice. That can't be easy, especially when they told you it was Vicente Luque standing on the other side of the octagon. I don't need to tell you this, but he's an awesome fighter. But what made you say, fuck yeah, man, I'll do this. I, I, I can take Vicente Luque. I, I was in shape and I was on weight. Uh, you know, I have full confidence in my abilities. Uh, don't matter who it is. So uh, it was an opportunity that presented itself, and I, I wanted to take full advantage of it. 
So you knew there was a lot to gain and that it was worth the risk, even though you didn't have a full, let's say, an 8 to 10 specific week camp for this guy. Hey, I got, I got five days notice. That sometimes, it, it sometimes works out better. I, I don't have this dude in my head or, or, or nothing. I don't have none of that self-doubt going on. I'm, I'm running off a good win, and uh, I'm confident my mind's right. So he should be worried about that. Two-part question. What do you weigh now, and what did you weigh when you took the call? Uh, I was 190 when I took the call, and uh, I'm, I'm a little bit about, I'm a little over 10 pounds out. That's not bad. All right. Derek Krantz, our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio. He's fighting Vicente Luque on Saturday. You can see him on the main card on ESPN+. The main event that night is Rafael Dos Anjos versus Kevin Lee. And I'll tell you another thing. Listen to his voice. He sounds calm and confident. Doesn't sound like anybody that's got his back to the wall because of the situation that he's in. He's taking this fight on five days' notice, folks. Mm -hmm. All right, goes. What do you have for Derek Krantz? Derek, whenever we talk to a fighter that is in this situation, the answer is usually the same. Like, as soon as they asked me, I said, hell yeah, let's do it. But then behind the scenes, when you talk to them, they kind of go, well, I needed to know where my weight was first. I needed to know where this fight was going to be. How many of those check marks are you hitting? Like, was it really like, let's do it? Or did you, how many questions did you ask before you actually so, said, let's so do it? This is how it played out. I just got done training. I was, uh, I just got out of the shower. I'm, I'm, I got one thing on my mind, and that's Chipotle. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm literally fixing to go eat me a big old meal at Chipotle. <laughs> and, uh, I look at my phone, I look down at my phone, and I see a text from my manager, and he was asking me if I could uh, make 170 for a fight this Saturday. And I immediately dropped what I was doing, just undressed right there on the spot, walked to the scale, and checked my weight, and then went right back to the phone and told him I could make weight. What if he would have texted you after Chipotle? Would that have changed <laughs> anything? Yeah, would you have been 194? Everything. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that would have changed everything. He was going to double up on I the steak and chicken and, and extra yeah, rice and beans. What, what's yeah. your order at Chipotle, yeah. by the way? Take us to it. Uh, all right, I like the brown rice, black beans, vegetables, double steak, mild, medium, hot, corn, sour cream, and cheese. Wait, you get mild, my hero. medium, and hot? You get all the sauces? I want every bit of that flavor. Wow. Gangster. Oh, man. This oh, guy's yeah. my hero now. Yeah. You know how hard it is when you have something set in your mind that that's what you're gonna, your next meal is going to be to have to stop and not no, get nothing it? Nothing's stopping me. I'm sending everyone to oh. voicemail. I'm not taking no call. Hey, De by the way, did he specify UFC or did he just say, can you fight on Saturday? Like, how, how much info did he actually give you? I'll. I want to say he specified the UFC. Oh, okay. I, I, I'd have to look at the message. So, but but first he wanted to know if I could make weight. And then once I told him I could, then he told me uh, we got a last minute, uh, last minute replacement for the UFC uh, opponent, Vicente. And uh, I was like, hell yeah. Uh, I had to look him up because I've, I've never seen him fight or anything. So, so I watched. Really? Uh, you, you haven't heard of Vicente Luque? <laughs> No. Oh, okay. Now, Derek, usually you're a big pressure fighter. Does the fact that it's, uh -huh. like, on short notice, does what does that do to strategy and fights for you? No, it, it, it's got to stay the same, man. Uh, uh, I, I know I know uh, Vicente, he's going to do the same thing. You know, he, he's a forward, 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 forward fighter. And, uh, he, you know, people who are really comfortable going forward aren't very comfortable moving backwards. You know, um, so it's, you know, openings will, will, will come available, and that, that, that's the way I'm attacking it. If you saw Vicente Luque on the reality show, he was only 7-5-1 and one back then. Since then, he's gotten 8-1. He's gotten really, really good. Uh -huh. His only loss is to Leon Edwards. But I guess my question is more, you haven't heard of him because you don't really follow the sport too closely, or is he just one of the guys that slipped through the cracks, you know, so much MMA out there. I, I would, I would guess uh, it was a little bit of both. You know, uh, I'm, I'm a, I'm a father. You know, a husband. Uh, I'm a coach. Uh, matter of fact, I was getting uh, my team. I had, uh, we have five fighters fighting in Shreveport this Friday, and uh, I was actually getting them all ready for their fights and and getting their weight in check and looking forward to cornering them this this Friday and. Uh, you know, I, this is not how I expected my week to play out. 
that that's the team five one five that I'm reading about here. That that's your squad. Yep, that's my squad. Oh, nice, man. And how uh, how deep do you guys roll? How many pro fighters and ami fighters are on Team 515? We got six pros and at least 15, 20 amateurs. Okay. Wow. And you're the head coach or just one of the coaches? No, I'm just one of the I'm I'm, I'm training partner slash jiu-jitsu coach. I'm the, I'm the only black belt in the gym right now. Wow. And you got some knockouts, too. So you can get it done on the feet. You can get it done on the ground. Mm. And uh, you're, you've are got 33 fights. So uh, you've made that walk many a times. This will be your debut in the UFC. But it's not like you're short on experience. No, no. Yeah, I feel very confident with my power and I'm very confident with my submissions. Uh, I mean, I've, I've finished – Probably what, 19, 20. I saw that. Of my yeah, you have a high finishing rate. Of all my yeah, so uh, I, I'm pretty good at, at, at noticing a finish and 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 and, and getting after it. Um, you know, I, I feel like that's one of my strong points. Um, but you know, uh, obviously, so so is Vicente's. I mean, he's got eight finishes in his last eight bouts. So I mean, that's. That's impressive as well. Yeah. Well, this could be a big upset. We're based here in Las Vegas. We actually broadcast from a sports book. And if you're curious, uh, I'll tell you this. You, you already know, I'm sure, you're the underdog. You're coming in. Not many people are aware of, of you. And, and Vicente Luque's, you know, been doing this for a while. He's at minus 800. You're at plus 550. But, like I say, I take a look. And like Go said, you're a pressure fighter. You go forward. You look for the finish. Um, and you, like I say, you, your demeanor sounds like you're very, very calm and not intimidated at all. And who knows, man? That's when some of the biggest upsets have taken place in this sport. Yeah, uh, man, I'm, I'm looking forward, looking forward to it. I had to look up where Marshall, Texas is. You guys are on the east, northeast kind of of Texas, right? Yeah, we're east Texas. We're 40 minutes uh, west of Shreveport. Man, I drove through that area once. It's pretty country there, right? It's not very urban. It ain't. It ain't too bad. I mean, the population is is almost thirty. Thirty thousand. Chipotle, <laughs> George. And, and yet, yeah, yeah. I was you do have a Chipotle, huh? <laughs> I mean, they got one of those. So as long as you have to no, drive four I, hours to Dallas I, to get a Chipotle or nothing. No, we got a Chipotle in Longview, which is which is where Longview MMA is. Team five one five. And that's, oh. that's about 20 minutes away from my house. All right. Well, listen, I know you're three hours ahead. That makes it almost 9 p.m., and you got to weigh in in the morning. So we'll keep it short. But, hey, you've been a, a ton of fun to talk to. Uh, this is our first time having you. But, seriously, like I say, you sound like you're very, very, very prepared for this fight despite the five-day notice. So we wish you the best of luck with the weight cut. And, of course, on Saturday, go out there and do your thing and have some fun, Derek. You know what I mean? Enjoy it. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for having me, man. And uh, dude, just 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 letting you know, God's good, man. All right, God is good. Thank you, thank you for the time, Derek. Take care. All right, folks. That's Derek Krantz at D Rock Krantz MMA. Um, ants in your pants. No, nope. he's scared it might catch on. <laughs> I might thank him on via Twitter. Thanks for the time, ants in your pants, Krantz. I get one retweet, it'll start I kinda, to catch on a little. I wanted to catch on just because I want to hear Bruce Buffer have to say it. Ants in your pants, Krantz? Yeah. Right? I don't know you could do it without Everybody laughing. would laugh. Everybody <laughs> would laugh and giggle, but they not at him with them. They'd go, oh, that's silly, but I get it. If he's him, then he's got to, like, shimmy, right? Is he saying that or something? Like, there's ants in his pants? Kind of, yeah. But then again, that D-Rock story, that's what led to him being D-Rock. <laughs> I mean, I don't want that to get out. I don't want little kids in first grade thinking it's okay to just... Wing a rock at people, but sounds like someone came at him. He just made the bad decision of throwing it into the crowd. But a sniper I, went at him, and he came back with a bazooka. Right? Kind of. I'm just taking everyone out. Kind of. Yeah. All right. That was fun. That was fun to talk to Derek Krantz. Good luck against Vicente Luque. Luque's a stud. I don't mean to sound make it sound like like Krantz, you know, has no chance or anything like that. Uh, it's just that Luque really is one of those guys that I've had to take a hard look at uh, when I do the rankings on the weekends because he's just on a roll. Remember his last fight that was a Barbarina fight? So I took a lot of that, a lot of that emotion. Just I was really, really stoked. And I felt like that fight, whether you knew him or not, you had to know him after that fight. But seriously, he's 8-1 and one in the UFC since the reality show. And prior to that, he was 7-5-1. and one. 
So you look at his record, 14-6-1, you're like, okay, is he really that good? No. Just pay attention to the 8-1. He's solid. What if his nickname was In Your Ladies? Jesus. In Your Ladies Pants Crants. <laughs> uh, I'd laugh at that one, too. That'd yeah. be pretty funny. That'd be pretty bold. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. We're going to take our last break. It's MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 156. We'll be back in a couple minutes. Two to be exact. We're going to do our daily debate. Champions Hall of Famer. Come on. It's tough to beat that song, right? It's dope. I mean, it is They were is abducted smooth. by aliens and instantly returned for raiding all their snacks. They are Gorgeous George and Goes. Like, and this is MMA Junkie Radio. Is that like the song you would want as you're pulling into the girl's driveway? First date? And you're wondering if you're going to get a kiss or not? Just, I would want her to be just hearing turned that off the as engine. I'm walking up. Hmm? I would want her to be hearing that as I'm walking to Oh, as you're walking door. up. The date hasn't started yet. Yeah. No, I'm saying the date's concluded yet. Oh, yeah, you're of both, course. You, you kind of had a good night, but then all of a sudden you just like, uh, you're in the middle of the story. You pull in and you're listening. Let's listen to a little music and finish that story. And then all of a sudden, boom, that hits. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. It's a done uh, deal. You got you to do lean over and it's, it, it is a done deal. All right. 
Thank you very much to Derek Kranz for his time. Literally, he's probably in a bathtub maybe when he was talking to us. They have to weigh in uh, early morning over there. It's a three-hour time difference. So, but but I thought I thought he came off well. Like I, I if you like told me he's going to be on in a few weeks, I'd be like, cool, let's do it. Uh, who do we have to thank for lining that one up? Uh, Ed Cap. All right, tip of the cap it. for him. Yep. All right, now I think is the perfect time for us to do our daily debate. The brothers Garcia seemingly can't agree on anything. Everybody knows it's duck season. Rabbit season. Duck season. Rabbit season. Whether it's food. Last feeling. Tastes great. Last feeling. Tastes great. Gambling. Always bet on black. I like red. Black. Red. Black. Red. Black, dummy. Or even social media. Instagram. Snapchat. Instagram. Snapchat. The same applies to the biggest stories in MMA. Time for MMA Junkie Radio's Daily Debate. Today's hashtag daily debate question for at MMA Junkie Radio. Which former UFC champion with a title fight booked at this moment has the best chance to reclaim gold? Frankie Edgar. As you all know, he signed on to fight Max Holloway at UFC 240 on July 27th. Holly Holm, as you all know, she's going to fight uh, Amanda Nunes on July 6th, UFC 239. Stipe Miocic, he just signed on to fight Daniel Cormier. UFC 241 in Anaheim on August 17th. Wow. Those are three great champions. But we got to pick someone. Basically, you know what? We're not picking who we think has the best chance to win. We're almost saying this is the champion I think has the biggest chance of choking in the big fight. Hmm. Uh, but anyway, we don't really mean that that way. These are all – these are six great fighters. Who would you pick, goes? I'm going with Frankie Edgar, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay. I feel like uh -huh. Frankie Edgar is getting a fighter in Max Holloway that just took one of the biggest beatings he's ever taken in his life. Mm -hmm. To Dustin Poirier? He's getting it right after that. Uh, Frankie is a difficult matchup when you look at how fast he moves, the way he can mix in his takedowns, his striking, he's in and out. He's kind of a nightmare for a guy like Max Holloway. My number two would have been Stipe Miocic. He's going up against... One of the goats. Mm -hmm. Rather roll the dice with Frankie Edgar. Holly Holm has no chance. She has a chance, but not what is, enough for what me is Amanda's to pick. biggest strengths? Hits hard. She's tough. She doesn't close her eyes. She just comes forward. Right, but she throws hands. Right, that's that's kind right. of her biggest weapons. What was Holly Holm a champion of before she came over to the UFC? Kickboxing. Well, Don't no. do it. We're boxing. Boxing. Don't do it. And she kickboxed her way to a, a few nice big wins, highlight real wins in Legacy. Don't do it. And she's got experience. She's fearless. I'm she warning you. She fought Ronda. She's fought Cyborg. So she's not walking in there scared. She's basically trying to figure out, are my hands going to be better than her? I think she might be more technical than Amanda Nunes. Technical, yeah. But I don't feel like – I feel like – She's the type of girl that Amanda can just watch tape on and be prepared for. Mm -hmm. I think Ronda kind of took that fight. She just really thought she was Ronda. She was going to run through everyone, and I think she caught her by surprise. But in this case, Amanda Nunes has just been prepared for everything. I mean, put Valentina Shashenko in front of her twice. She's a hell of a striker, and you she know, put up uh, with it. Amanda, er, sorry, Valentina gave her good fights, but it was never enough. You know, Amanda Nunes... I still don't think she gets enough credit for that one calf kick she threw at Cyborg. I feel like that's what made Cyborg go a little berserk mm -hmm. sooner than she needed to. That's just something that the American top team really, really pushes. Uh, and I feel like that may be something she can also come into play against uh, Holly Holm. I'm also with you. I think Frankie Edgar is a bad matchup for Max Holloway because of the wrestling and how he's committed to it. And his, once he gets you down, his ground and pound is very solid. There's a lot of fighters where you're like, okay, if he gets him down now, what? Advance his position, look for dominant positions, blah, blah, blah. Frankie Edgar is very comfortable with just beating the shit out of you if he's on top. Plus, you made another good point, and that's Max Holloway is just in a war. So, I don't know. But I'm also with you. I just think Holly Holmes the second one, second choice. Yeah. Yeah, and it was pretty close between the two. And Steven Miocic would be my third choice because DC – He's as long as he's not too distracted by John, the whole John Jones deal, mm -hmm. he's just vanquished anybody you put in front of him with the exception of John Jones. I think if we put a good head, you would not give that response. 
If I put a gun to your head, you're not taking Daniel Cormier from Miocic? If you put a gun to my head, yeah. my first choice is Frankie. Yeah. The next one is Stipe. Yeah. And then it's Holly. No, I'm going Frankie, Holly, Stipe. Or, yeah, but if I put yeah. a gun to your head, I don't think you're saying that. All right, you got me. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, Amanda's a beast. All right. Look, almost 1,000 votes came in, and the voting's going to end in about two minutes. So I think I'm pretty safe to say almost 1,000 votes came in. But this is how it came down, goes. 65% said Stipe Miocic. Damn. That was our number three. That was their number one. 24% said Holly Holm. Only 11% of Junkie Nation thinks that Frankie Edgar has a chance to upset Max Holloway. That was, that was, that was a uh, result that surprised me a little bit. Uh, shout out to at... Mailman Matt, he says, can't see it working out for any of them. Jimmy from the 570, and his Twitter handle is any plus ultra x100. He says, E, none of the above. So, not much confidence in any of them had we put a none of the above. That's the daily debate brought to you by the MMA Junkie Radio team. All right. We will be back here in about 60 seconds. This is the quickest break you'll ever hear. I don't even know if you have enough time to open a beer and go to the restroom. So you might as well just sit there and wait because we'll be back in 60 seconds. MMA Junkie Radio on Fight Nation, Channel 156. Their mantles are covered with participation awards. They have boxes of gold stars that they purchase themselves. They are the legends and demand your respect. Here are George and Goes. You're welcome, Junkie Nation. That's my choice as well. Oh, yeah. ZZ Top. I was going to say, this might be the song that's playing when I'm walking to the door. Is it? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Andre the Giant chose that one, but that's one of my favorite songs. I grew up with uh, the ZZ Top videos. All right, showtime from Tennessee. Sorry about that, partner. Uh, uh, now's a good time to hit us back if you want. Right now, we're going to take Kevin from Chicago. If you want to follow Kevin from Chicago, it's 888-877, excuse me, Fight93, 877-344-4893. What's up, Kevin? What in the world of wrestling would you like to talk about? Um, not wrestling. Anderson Silva, as long as the UFC is going to keep paying them hundreds of thousands of dollars, then I don't blame them for... Um, I don't blame him for coming back and taking that money. I mean, a guy like Klitschko, if he came back, they would be offering millions. I mean, twenty million, some ridiculous amount. Anderson Silva, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I feel like the UFC should put their foot down and not. All right, you had your run, but he's just going to keep milking them, keep milking them for all he's worth. Uh, yeah, I think they should get rid of him. I think you got to just put your foot down. With BJ Penn, you got to call it a day. Minotaro, even hit, even though he had a win, I feel like he should have been retired. Uh, man, the UFC just keep milking these old guys for their name value. I don't like it. Kevin, shoot but me I did straight talk though. About shoot me straight. This past Saturday on that card, were you more glued to Guida versus Penn or Luana Carolina versus Priscilla Cachoeira? Well, I don't really like um. Too much female MMA, but all I'd right, love to right. see some up and coming fighters. All right, were you more glued to Guida versus Penn or Holaba versus Moises? 
Paula Ball versus Moises. Shut up. No, you weren't. That was a really... <laughs> How about Pan and Guida versus Barcelos oh, no, no, and Joaquin? Um, Which one were you more glued yeah, to? Pan and um, which one? Was anybody going, um, Barcelos, Barcelos, or was anybody going, watching, watching, wa I mean, everybody was screaming, BJ, BJ, BJ. There's still something about the, the star that value that these guys carry, and if they're willing to make the money, and they've already looked after themselves, and it's safe for them to fight, and the promotion can promote a card or get ratings off them, what's the problem? Is it worth two hundred grand though? It if might, that, I mean, you know, the UFC doesn't more. like the, the UFC runs a tight ship, and uh, I imagine they wouldn't do it. I mean, they they signed the guy to a contract; they got to live up to the contract if the fighter's willing to go. You know what I would do? Right. You already pulled off one trade. Talk to another organization about a second one. That's interesting. All right, but I I gotta say I enjoyed Pan and Guida. I really did. I enjoyed it more than and I kid you not, more than Araujo versus Bernardo. Barcelos versus Joaquin, Carolina versus Cachoeira. Marias and, Ar and Alves was pretty good because Marias was hanging in there just enough, but Alves just looked impressive. I enjoyed it more than Moises versus Holovar. And right about Span and O'Gara, I was like, okay, I get it. You know, like, you know, O'Gara also, I, I guess, is pretty special. Um, and, and we know Ryan Span could be, you know, part of the future. Aldana versus Correa. I think I enjoyed Guida and Penn more watching that as well. Now, Starapoli versus Alves was pretty violent. And then after that, yeah, I have nothing to say. But I, I guess there's just – look, I'm, I'm part of me is also playing the other side, the devil's advocate. There, there's something still there. I heard the chants, the Hawaiian music, Clay Guida getting slapped. Like, that was cool. That, that, that was one where you said, uh, no, honey, I'll take the trash out after this fight. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um and I think that resonates in many different ways, whether it's traffic, a, a, a spike in traffic, a spike in Google alerts, anything that alerts to a possibility and how they can make some money. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think that's the equation there. Because otherwise, they would, you're right. They wouldn't pay these guys money if they didn't have to. That car didn't need Guida and Penn. That's for sure. But they needed to place these guys somewhere. But as I looked, I think that might be uh, listener Scott from Minnesota from like 10 years ago who used to be a really, really thin dude. But now it looks like he's packed on some muscle for a second there. I thought he was Paul Felder. <laughs> anyway, That's a compliment. I mean, what, what, what do you think goes? I think it's too much money for a guy that's not. I mean, if you were to announce this as his last fight, yeah, I could see people. But that would be terrible if that. they said, look, we're going to cut your pay in half. That's the contract the UFC agreed to. Yeah, you to. cut him. Or you ask him, you push him towards retirement. Like Chuck Liddell. They kind of pushed him in that direction. What if the fighters being up front and saying, okay, but I'm going to go somewhere else and fight? Do you want another promotion to get? You know, sometimes you see the, in they the, cared in the about business that. Now of squashing I don't think they out do. other little fires. I used to think that they cared about that. Now, now I think I'm not so sure they do. All right. Like I said, I'd put them up for trade. Yeah. Do another one. Yeah. Alexander Volkanovsky. He defeated Jose Aldo this past uh, Saturday at UFC 237. And, well, this guy brought a gang now. Who are those guys? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Uh, he defeated Alex Volkanovsky at UFC 237. Sorry, Volkanovsky defeated Jose Aldo at UFC 237. On his way home, there was a layover in Chile. And, um, before, well, actually, no. Before he boarded the plane, he wasn't feeling well. His foot was hurting, but when he landed in Chile, the fi the uh, pain was so unbearable that he got off the plane and went straight to the hospital. Actually, a doctor tended to him in Santiago, Chile at the airport and said, you need to get to the doctor. Found out he had an infection. They gave him antibiotics. You've seen the pictures of him in the hospital. It's an infection in his blood, right? It was in his foot, but as far as like where and all that, that part okay. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Compounding the 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 worst news, if you will. Remember, this is the guy that won. But on his but post fight, things didn't go well for him. First that, then he finds out he's not getting the title shot. UFC pretty much uh, around the time we were doing our show on Monday night, 
with Frankie Edgar's manager, Ali Abdelaziz, the news broke that Frankie Edgar would be facing Max Holloway in Edmonton, Canada on August, sorry, July 27th. Yeah, it's UFC 240. First of all, let's go to a little bit of an update here. Uh, excuse me, some audio that we have to City Kickboxing coach Eugene Behrman talking to Submission Radio, and this is his reaction on finding out that it's Edgar versus Ferguson. Uh, and then we'll give you a little bit of a health update on Volkanovski. Hit it, Andre. Got it, mate. <laughs> Absolutely livid. 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 Like, we talked about this for such a long time. We talked about it. With, with our team talked about it. We need to... Our goal was to set the scenario up. And for all, for all our knowledge, this is what the UFC were were looking for. This is what they wanted. They wanted. They needed Volko to win that fight. They needed Israel to get into the position. And then we got a, uh, uh, an Australasian super card set up. Yeah. All, all because of the work that we've put in and, and the position we've put ourselves into. Um, and that was all to get to this goal, to get to that super card. And we were obviously, the UFC was on a different page. We didn't think so. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, absolutely gutted is what they said. And I understand their point. Look, who's going to who's gonna play dumb here and say, really, that caught you off guard? I mean, he's won 17 in a row, uh, seven just in the UFC alone. But the fact remains that... Uh, the UFC went in another direction. We can speculate on many different reasons, but Jesus, we kind of heard it explicitly from Ali Abdelaziz. They felt like they owed one to Frankie because Andre's been a com sorry, Frankie's been a company man for so many years. Uh, he saved a couple title fights. He's been unselfish, and they wanted to give it to him. I think in the long run, this will end up being a good thing for Wolkanovski. I can understand 100% why he's upset why he's hurt but i think in the long run it'll be a good thing for him mm -hmm. the update and you're right goes it was a blood infection by the way his condition is stable he's responding well to treatment but he's still under supervision at the hospital in in uh santiago chile his manager gave an update and says he'll be reassessed in 48 hours 48 hours will be tomorrow because this was posted yesterday they want to make sure the infection is completely under control before he's giving any tra uh, clearance to travel home. I would imagine that if he was going through Chile, there's a flight from Chile to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And that still has to be a good 10 hours. Because I know Chile to Easter Island. I don't know why I know this fun fact, but that's eight hours. I it's thought it was right off the coast of Chile. No, that's the Galapagos Islands you're thinking of. That's on, on the Ecuador. coast of Ecuador, yeah. No, but Easter Island, Doesn't which it I think is overseen by Chile, is eight-hour flight. If you look at the map, you'll go, oh, I get it, because it is far. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's why I think they want to make sure that he's good to go before he's allowed to travel. So as of right now, he's still in a hospital in uh, Santiago, Chile, and he's still slowly but surely recovering. So um, now I think we have a little bit more audio from the coach. Um, that's kind of a – this is Eugene Behrman, his city boxing coach. He basically – expands a little bit more on why Frankie doesn't deserve it more than Volkanovski. I mean, uh, and it's, this has nothing to do with Frankie. I mean, I don't know Frankie. I don't know his coaches. I don't know his management or anything. And it's not about that Frankie doesn't deserve it. He probably does deserve it. He just doesn't deserve it more than Alex Volkanovski deserves it. Uh, unfortunately for Frankie, him and his team advised him to take that risky fight against Brian Ortega and, and fully understand why you've got to do that because... You can't wait around forever. Your family has to eat. You have to earn money, okay? But it's called a risk for a reason. And I know Volko already alluded to this, but it's called a risk for a reason. Unfortunately, he lost, and then he beat Cub Swanson, so he's now he's won one fight. Now he's going into the total fight. Wow. Volko has won seven. Out of the UFC, he's 17 in a row. Seven straight. Just beat Aldo, who, who uh, Frankie's fought twice and never managed the best. Yeah. Um. If you, the, the, the popular opinion out there amongst fans and all these experts and so-called experts and analysts is that Volker was an excellent line and we were on that same um, thought train and then to have it whipped out from underneath us is uh, devastating for our team, devastating to be honest. 
Now listen, in this sport, aside from PFL and the organizations that run tournaments, it just basically becomes a, de a, a business decision made by most companies. I guess some of the factors that contribute are, are contribute to this can be anywhere from loyalty to tenure to we owe you one to many reasons. The contract, holdouts, spite. I mean, we've seen it all. He is right in terms of there's what more can you ask from Volkanovski. Volkanovski wasn't one Nothing. of those where you can go. Like, look at Vicente Luque. He's 8-1, but he hasn't beaten the equivalent of Aldo in welterweight. He hasn't beaten the equivalent of Chad Mendes in welterweight. So you can go, Luque, I get it. You're 8-1, but you still got some work to do. Okay. Volkanovski, the opposite. Aldo was working off a two-fight win streak against two good fighters. One was Jeremy Stevens, who's a veteran who's been around for a while, but was on a roll. The other one was Hanato Maikano, who's still young in the sport and could still possibly get a world title. He won them both, and he finished them both. So his 7-1, and one, he kind of hit a lot of the check marks. So I understand his frustration. Um, again, though, it, this isn't a tournament. This isn't like the NBA or... NHL or and you know NC2A basketball tournament that just because you win doesn't mean anything. A lot of it goes back to many of the criteria listed before. We spoke to Frankie Edgar yesterday. He gave a little bit of reasoning on why he feels like it's his shot. Let's hear that. When people use the argument like, "Hey, you know, Frankie was a, a, a team player, UFC 222. Uh, Max had gotten hurt. You still went ahead and fought." Was that your own personal argument as well, or do you feel like your career stands on its own, or were there other reasons why you felt like you should be the guy? I think all of it combined. You know, my body of work. Uh, you know, what I've done in the past, past what I've done for UFC, opportunities that I, I may have, uh, you know, I could have waited for, I didn't, and stepped in and fought. So I think the combination of all that stuff, you know, led led me to to, to get another title shot. You know. I've been doing the right things in this sport since day one and never shot away from a, from a challenge or never shot away from an opponent that just wanted me to. So I feel like uh, this is definitely meant to be. What do you think, Goes? Sat satisfied? <sighs> I mean, sort of. I mean, I really think if you put the resumes up next to each other, there's no reason why you shouldn't go Volkanovski. But I understand why they're going Frankie Edgar. And I'm kind of okay with it. There's only certain scenarios where things like this happen where you go, meh, all right. I think this is one. And I actually, I like Volkanovski, and I really think this is going to be something that's going to end up working in his favor. So do I, because the UFC is going to Sydney on October 5th or 6th. And guess what? We asked Frankie Edgar uh, if he would fight on the same, pretty much the same timeline as this past Monday, when he was told he was fighting a Mac, uh, Max, to when he's fighting Max is the same timeline as when he fights Max, 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 until when that fight card in Sydney is. And he said he told us without committing, he said, "Look, I want to fight a second time, really bad in 2019." Yes, he would be open to it, but he also threw out New York, so he played it safe. I like that. That's one, it's a quote out there that you don't have to pin it to him. You know, pin him to the wall and go, you said he left like an opening. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? That, that's a veteran who knows how to do media. So I would say Volkanovski fans, just hang tight. That's not too far in the distant future. And you might be able to get get your guy a title shot in his home country against the winner, Max versus Frankie. I agree. Now, Goes did throw something out, and that's the, the rematch. Nightmare scenario. The nightmare scenario would be the rematch. But, hey. Let's get to this fight first, and then we'll worry about it. It's hell, not that far-fetched, Hell, let's dude. just get to Saturday first, and let's get to Chicago next, and then International Fight Week, and then let's get to July before we even think of the nightmare scenario. And let's let Volkanovski get healthy. When we come back, we're going to talk about another big name in the UFC who apparently was called up to fight. He's a fighter that hasn't fought in a while, but he was called up to fight one of the participants in the main event this next weekend we'll tell you all about that when we come back it's mma junkie radio on fight nation channel 156 
Real show begins. Take it away, boys. All right, here are the best of the MLS on Series 6 MFC. Early MVP candidate Carlos Vela leads high flying LAFC against FC Dallas. Coverage kicks off tonight at 10 Eastern on Series 6 MFC 157 and streaming on your phone and at home on Series 6 M connected devices and speakers. Who's your favorite pilot? Andre? You have yours? Oh, you're ta- okay. I'm talking to all of uh, you. Let's see. My favorite pilot. I would have to go with the Iceman. Flawless pilot right there. <sighs> uh, I mean, come on. It's not like we saw much flying. Uh, I guess. So Maverick's the easy way out. and He just took the other one. Uh, yeah, then Goosey get all emotional about there's it. There's Hollywood. Right? Well, Goose Wolfman, was a pilot, though, right? Or is he considered co-pilot. a co-pilot? Yeah, I guess pit character then. There's Jester. Okay, then I like the Viper. aggressive black guy. He's like, yo, man, we had a shot. We That's had sundown. a shot. That sundown? Yeah. And give me that guy. Sounds like he knows what's up. He's ready to bounce back. He's not sitting there moping over Goose. He can't read a room, though. Huh? He can't read a room. Like, he should have known. You, you think he, he should have like got off the plane chances. and said, hey, silly Goose, when are you going to shoot? <laughs> no, I mean, he had to be still. somewhat aggressive, right? I would have said, bitch, you're the co-pilot. What do you care? Your name ain't going up on that plaque. <laughs> uh, who else? Let me see here. There's Merlin. There's Cougar. There's Wolfman, Hollywood. Well, didn't... Oh, no, wait. Jester got caught, huh? Hollywood and Wolfman are awful. Are they? Yeah, I don't know where they got called up from. Okay. Yeah, I'll just go with Sundown, man. I'll just Sundown? I'm good with that, man. That is, it turns out that is Listener Scott. But I don't know if Listener Scott was part of this other group. Uh, I think they were foreigners. Foreigners? Yeah. I wish. I, I got just, uh, if you listen to this show, you're more than invited to come in and say hello at the Mandalay Bay Resort and Casino. Please just walk into the studio. Or you can come up to the window and hold up your phone showing us the app. And that shows, shows us that uh, you know who we are and we'll invite you in. Or just walk in. I mean, the door is always open. And if you walk in, we'll kind of give you a stop right there sign, which means, hey, stay out of the field of the camera. We'll be on commercial soon, and then we'll come up and say hello. So, but regardless, we appreciate everybody's support. All right, guess who almost signed on to fight in the UFC recently? Anyone? Yeah. Jorge Masvidal and somebody? No. Nope. Are you sure? Because I know the answer. All right. I'll just say it. It was Nick Diaz. RDA, Rafael de Sanjos, was doing an interview with some reporters, like a scrum, prior to his. Here's. We talked about some other options. And even. On. Shelby. in a fight with you, end quote. But, that's the end of uh, Shelby's quote. He continues, things did not work out, and the only name they threw at me was Kevin. He's a top contender at lightweight, coming up a division, and I can't sit on my sofa waiting for the perfect fight. I've got to work. So, uh, alright, is that something to get excited about? Not really. Only in the fact that, hey, I guess if Nick approached Sean, then maybe he's closer to thinking about the return. His brother... Nate, which we haven't talked about much on this show, are bad. Maybe we came back so high off UFC 237 and Bellator 221 and having Ali in, in the studio and you know talking about his roster. We just kind of have made it all the way to Thursday not talked about it much. But if you haven't heard, Nate Diaz, the younger brother, is supposed to fight Anthony Pettis at UFC 241. By the way, it goes, I don't know if it was a poster or what I saw, but that was badass. The John Jones one? DC and Miocic. Costa and Romero, Diaz and Pettis. I was like, God, I mean, if you live in Southern California, Anaheim to be more exact, how can you complain about UFC 241? That is a stack car. That's what I consider a one, two, three punch. So Cowlers, LA people, San Diego people, but especially OC people, and even you, my Inland Empire patrons out there. Let me tell you something. That is a nice one, two, three punch. You have a title fight. Daniel Cormier, the heavyweight champion against Stephen Miocic. You got Nate Diaz from the 209 versus Anthony Pettis, who just knocked out Stephen Thompson. And you got Paulo Costa against Yoel Romero, two hard-hitting middleweights. 
that is the first three fights announced for August 17th at the Honda Center in Anaheim, California. I thought you were going another route. I thought, no, did you Nick see this Diaz, poster? Nick Diaz, by the way, is the one that was mentioned there by Rafael Dos Anjos. So maybe little brothers fighting, money's running low, I don't know. But according to Sean Shelby, he told Rafael Dos Anjos that Nick was interested in fighting him, but it didn't come together. Do you don't think it's a cool poster? Jones versus Santos, Nunes versus Holm. Yeah, that's cool. I thought that's what you were talking about. I haven't no. seen the other poster. Oh, no. It was just all six fighters lined up side by side by uh, side. Oh, okay. And I was like, dude, that is legit. That is that, Aren't those three great fights? Yeah, it is. Can't argue with that, man. All right. So that's, that's kind of like a, a little bit of a news update. Let's take a couple quick calls here before we go, go to the next break. It's Showtime in Tennessee. What's up, Showtime? It's Yo Time. Hey, what's going on, fella? What up? Not much. How about you? Good, man. I I was trying to call in last night, too, man. I, I didn't want to be a, a Debbie Downer on you guys' little party, but, man, it's time for Dan Tom's homeboy to call it quits, man. BJ Penn? Yeah, it's time for BJ to call it quits, man. But why off of this fight and not what? the previous three is, is my question. Like, th this but one, he actually man. competed. But he, lo he still looked like shit, though, man. Ah, his cardio you know, ran out. Around. But, I like, he didn't get taken man. down and just man. pummeled like other people have done. He didn't really but get knocked down. Or, or he's banged up, though. I guess. I guess I and saw And he's got different. personal issues. I think it might be time to go. But, but you, know, you know you know what I'm going to tell you, though? I was sitting there looking at, the, at this money. Anderson made six hundred and twenty grand. It, it's hard to walk away from that, man. I mean, e even though Anderson, had Anderson, from looking at it, Anderson and BJ is supposed to be, you know, pretty well off, man. But Where, where'd you get those it's salaries? It's hard to walk away from that. Where'd you get those from, salaries? Where did I get this from? Uh, <clears throat> damn, where did I get it from? I don't know. I screenshotted it on some MMA site, man. Clay uh, Greeter made one thirty-eight. BJ. They got 170, 150 to show, 20 for a fight night. There it is. All right, I got, got Rose. You. Damn, Rose some good money being slung around. Now now, but now check this out, man. Yeah. I can see why a lot of these fighters, man. But think, this is fucking peanuts, man, to what boxers make, man. Well, that's I a whole other. Yeah, you have a point. No one's arguing that. But this is all, that's a whole other discussion. But just let's just concentrate on Anderson Silva. So I see the number right here. Um, I'm going off thesportsdaily.com. Anderson Silva, folks, got paid six hundred and twenty thousand dollars, six hundred to show and twenty thousand to fight. So let's say a month out, his knee kind of gave out. Trainer comes over and goes, "You all right? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, I can call and no, no. Let me go through a couple days. Let me see if I get get through this. Put a, a brace on. But you know that if maybe somebody looks at you and you're told that maybe you need to go through a surgery or whatever. I mean, remember they're fighting in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. The next fight card is in Chicago. The next fight card is in Las Vegas." And then Edmonton. And so he's probably going, oh, that fucking sucks. Mm -hmm. I can just stay right here. I don't have to move my camp or anything. But he also knows that somebody's going to hand him a check for $600,000. And plus, all those other countries would be foreign taxes to him. Yeah. So now his next fight, we know he's got to be making at least 600000 somewhere, unless in his contract it said something less. Penn's is a little less, 170 But still, 170 is still 170 nice. And if they want him to fight again, he's probably thinking 170 to just go out there and possibly beat somebody. And yeah, they might be me. Sure, where do I sign up? Showtime and goes would fight Clay Guida for 170 thousand. I would. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hell yeah! I go out there and get choked out or knocked out for 170. But you, you know what was disrespectful out of all this money, man? I'm sitting there looking at all this money. And I'm looking at what Jose Aldo made, man, and that that just broke my heart, man. 100. 10 grand, man. 130. Come on, man. That's no fucking respect, man. That's no respect, man. Any, I mean, come on, man. That that's fucking that's pathetic, man. Well, that, uh, pathetic. I I I don't disagree. That should be more cuz Nogueira made 128 to show, Aldo made 110 to show. The only thing I can think of that may have hurt Aldo is he's kind of had long spells where he hasn't fought and it could be that uh he just didn't go through newer contracts. He was always on a champion's contract where he made the champions pay of uh, points. So I'm sure he's, there's been fights where he's probably, you know, crossed over into seven uh, seven digits. 
But yeah, looking back at this, when he resorts to just being a challenger, he's back to 110,000 or whatever. That's all I can think of. All right, tell you what, that'll be kind of interesting. Maybe we'll hit that in the last segment. We got to go to break, though. It's time to make Junkie Radio on Fight Nation Channel 156. Stay close. We'll be talking to PFL featherweight Steven Seiler. Those two numb nuts, gorgeous George and Goes. All right, we're back. <laughs> Ready to talk to Steven Seiler, PFL featherweight, PFL feather uh, season one, PFL featherweight finalist. Took home 200k. Wasn't a million, but it was still 200k. Uh, got paid well along the way and got invited back to be a part of season two. Season two is uh, season two week two is a week from tonight. So May 23rd in Uniondale, New York, you get to see a main event featuring Lance Palmer and Alex Gilpin. And also on that same card is Steven Seiler against Godsey 
Raba, Rabaden, Rabadenov. There you go. Boy, some of those tricky names that the PFL throws my way. I struggle with them. Joining us now on the hotline, Steven Seiler. What's up, Steven? How you doing? Hey, what's up, guys? Not much, man. Welcome back to MMA Junkie Radio. You're on with George and Goes. And uh, we're excited to see your name pop up, uh, part of the roster for Season 2. I think you definitely earned your spot. Uh, and even though it wasn't your night on December 31st, you came pretty damn close, my man. And, and uh, I'm anxious to see how Season 2 goes for you. Yeah, Season 1 was definitely a, a fun ride, you know, especially fighting what, five times in six months. It was crazy. Um, good experience, good fight with Lance. You know, obviously, I wish it went my way, but, you know, hopefully this year's a little bit better. So your W-2s must have been pretty impressive. I mean, you fought the five times in 2018. You got the big payday of 200 grand for the for uh, making it, you know, to the finals. And that, that must have been a, a nice boost for your family compared to some of the other years, right? Yeah, but tax season sucks, man. And uh, especially when you're not paying taxes along the way. And then the wife doing real estate and killing it and that. So we, we definitely made good money, but tax season is definitely going to suck. I know, buddy, we put a delay, but... <laughs> Oh, you did the delay, huh? You lazy bastard, Steven Sider. Why didn't you do it? The, I mean, the, the, you had till April 15th. You, had, you, had th you have an off-season in the PFL. You could have just – you had plenty of time to do it. Yeah, but I've been out in Colorado since March. My tax guy's here in Utah. And I've been getting ready for the season since I got to Colorado. So I've been out there the whole time. All right. Well, that's good. That's a good enough excuse. The second good excuse would be that you can beat me up, so I'm just going to drop the subject. Um, <laughs> all right. Tell me about Godzi Rabadanov. Uh, what's this guy like? Uh, what have you studied up on him, and what does he bring to the table? And you know, what 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 are the what are his attributes that concern you the most? Well, honestly, I, I watched one side of his when I was heading home from the airport uh, from Colorado back to here. Yeah, uh, I was able to watch one. Uh, didn't know who he was. I haven't really looked much into him due to the fact that you guys noticed for the longest time I had TBA uh, next to my name, so they they kind of threw out different opponents that we never. We're quite sure who I was going to get. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, they threw out uh, Gahidi or whatever his name is. And uh, right when then, I sent it to my coach, uh, Mark Montoya, but uh, we weren't even positive. I wasn't even sure who I was fighting until I think MMA Junkie posted the actual card. But they posted somebody got hurt, and they posted the rest of the cards, and his name was actually next to mine. So uh, I didn't even find out until I go all down to your guys' website. Gotcha. All right. Well, when you've been in there with... Miller, Brown, Holobaugh, Elkins, Palmer, uh, Andre Harrison, you know what I mean? Like, uh, it's not like – I don't think there's any concern as far as him being even more of a standout than them. Um, I guess I was just wondering how much you get into the the breakdown of the opponent. I, maybe that's more of a Mark Montoya thing then? Yeah, Mark usually sends it to one of our coaches, uh, another one of our coaches, and he does the breakdown as well. But uh, Coach Caruso actually co breaks down – bit by bit and send you a big old text that I hate reading, but I know I should, uh, breaking down how the fight should go and how everything goes like that. How technical is it? Is it how the fight should go from your standpoint, or does he talk about like what, what, he, what both parties bring to the table? Both parties bring to the table, what I should do, how the finish should come, everything. The kid's, the kid's a legit, man. He knows his stuff. <laughs> Why is this something that you're a little bit more hesitant to, towards embracing like in football, part you know those guys that practice Monday through Friday and they play on Sunday. Well, guess what? Most of Monday through Friday, well, not most, but at least half, is basically in a room with the coaches and them, you know, hitting that clicker and just looking at all the possibilities, looking at the playbook, going over the game plan. And I'm wondering why a lot of MMA fighters uh, don't also like they they don't concern with themselves with that as much. Is it more of a mental thing? Well, you know what. Especially having as many fights as I've had and how many years I've been doing it, I'm not going to do much different and kind of change up my game plan to maybe make a mistake that's something I'm not very good at yeah. just because what the opponent does. So I'm just going to keep on, you know, enforcing my will against the guy and hopefully I get the W. Okay. All right. Steven Siler is our guest here on MMA Junkie Radio. He's got a fight coming up a week from tonight. Uniondale, New York. That is Long Island. And uh, this is... Season 2 of the PFL, and it's called PFL 2019 Week 2. All right, goes. What do you have for Steven Seiler?
Steven, I remember last time, well, not the last time we spoke to you, but last season, one of the first times when we spoke to you, you talked about everything you gave up to make this first season happen and the stress that, that came with it for, with family and all that type of stuff. That being said, because you made it to the finals last time, you get that automatic bid to come back. But was there ever any point where you had to sit down and really analyze whether you wanted to come back into this situation again? Or was it just a, a for sure thing? No, it was automatic. Especially, I mean, I knew once I made the playoffs last year, they already told me they're bringing me back for season two. So even before the season was over, we knew I was going to get back to doing it again. Now, this year has been a little bit harder uh, being away from the family uh, in Colorado as much as I have been. Uh, I mean, I'm about to have another baby here in about four weeks. So she's beyond pregnant, taking care of both kids and uh, doing everything her own, working two jobs. So it kind of makes me do feel a little bit more guilty being away. But at the same time, I saw how much it was worth last year, and she does too. And so, I mean... It does suck being away, and I feel guilty, but we both know it's for the best. Gotcha. And, and at the end of the season, did PFL ever pull everybody aside and just ask for your guys' feedback? I know a lot of the fans had, had uh, thrown some things out, a couple of rule changes here and there. Did they ever pull you guys aside, and did you offer any feedback for what they should do in Season 2? Um, No, they definitely didn't pull me aside, but I'm not – not much of a talker opinion person anyways. I kind of just say, hey, just do what you guys think best, and I'll go low, go with the flow. Steven, your fight's on ESPN2 this year. That's got to be a lot easier for your friends and family, you know, when you're when they're asking you about it, uh, to point them to a channel that's been around for a long time and is very, very popular. I mean, it's in most satellite and cable systems. Oh, you guys have no idea how stoked I was to find out PFL was going to be on ESPN. Uh, me being a huge sport fan, I, lo- I literally watch every sport, huge ESPN fan. Uh, second I found out about the ESPN deal, I think I ran upstairs and showed it to my wife. I was freaking out. I was so stoked about it. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And how many kids do you have now uh, total? I have, I have uh, two right now. My boy, whose birthday was yesterday. That's why I'm actually home right now. Uh, it was his birthday yesterday. He just turned five. I have my little girl who's one. And then, uh, like I said, I have another one coming here in a few weeks. Oh, that's cool. So the five-year-old, he's watching ESPN2, I take it, right? He knows what's going on. Oh, yeah, he knows. About, he came to the gym with me today with uh, me and Ramsey and uh, was fighting the little uh, little dummy bag while me and Ramsey and our few buddies were training. Uh, he, he knows all about fighting. That's awesome. Very, very cool. All right. Uh, well, listen. You're still with uh, Mark Montoya. You're still doing, you know, the, the camps over there. That's, that's very admirable. It's quite a sacrifice. And we know it because you shared that story with us. And I, I, I want to give a shout-out to your wife. I don't know her name, and I don't know if you want to say it, but that's fine if you don't. But, man, she really does seem to be an all-star for allowing you to do what you did. I know how much this paid off for you guys, so I'm just happy for your entire family. But, again, shout-out to her because – she she really is holding it down, and she's allowing you to chase this dream, and she's allowed you to leave the state to uh, you know to hook up with this other team and, and and do what you guys are doing. So that that's outstanding, man. That young lady deserves some praise. No, yeah, Mary, Mary's as tough as they come. I mean, the way that she's holding on the forward, and like I said last year, it was her idea for me to go out there and see if I could keep this fighting dream alive. I mean, I, I definitely I was so close to retirement. If it wasn't for her to push me through one last time. Uh, get, and is able to get my confidence back, and you know, I, I feel like I got some swagger down the cage. I'm excited every single time I'm in there again. Uh, and if it wasn't for her, I'd probably be off, you know, working some day job, where I'm hating my life and waiting on stuff. And um, yeah, I owe, I owe everything to her. Yeah, you fought 50 some. I think you're. This will be your 52nd fight or something like that. But you're only 32 years of age. Uh, why was retirement an option? Is, did you feel like you had just plateaued or, or your body's not holding up? Why, why does that R word creep up into your mind at all? Yeah, really, and especially once the UFC left, um, working, fighting for other organizations, I wasn't making as much money as I was usually on fighting. Right. And so uh, supporting the family where I think Will Sears only fought for him twice in a little over a year making at that time 10 and 10 and I lost both those fights um going broke uh we bought a house in the UFC we were falling behind on a bunch of things and 
uh, you know, le- learning how rough life really is. I mean, I think, man, maybe I should sit down and get a real job and actually make some real money. And then uh, once the PFL threw out uh, their format and how much money we'd be making, uh, <laughs> it definitely made sense to give it one more shot. So you literally have your – you have them to thank for the the resurgence in, in your life. Your life completely changed because of the PFL, right? It wasn't for the yeah. I mean, PFL definitely changed my life. Also, uh, Factory X. Factory X wasn't for them. The the teammates we have, the Mark Martoyer, all the coach, the, all the coaching staff, everyone there um, at the gym. Like the way they they get me excited to go to the gym every day. I'm excited to learn again. I'm excited just to have a head coach who I actually trust and I know who's going to guide me in the right direction to get me a W. Um, so between the PFL, my family, and factory, I, yeah, it, I owe them my life, man. Since December 31st until even today's workout, is part of your camp, part of your workouts, part of your training, is that designed to beat a guy like Lance Palmer, who could very well be there in the end? Like, uh, like specific to you know, basically he's just wrestling oriented. You know what I mean? How, how much did you just work on that? Since that's what stopped you from making another eight hundred thousand on December thirty first. You know, I, I feel last year the literally the entire camp out there was based around someone like Lance. Uh, I mean, the whole year we kept on saying, "Hey, it's going to be me and Lance in the finals." And literally from before, before it was even the June fights, I think it was out there in May, all the way till the end, we knew it was like, hey, it's going to be me and Lance. I, I just had a feeling, me and Lance in the finals the whole time. And the whole camp seemed based around that with some other tweaks to help me just become a better fighter overall. Uh, this year, I think it's been a little bit different where um, it's just been, we've been just going over everything, all techniques, uh, more, mostly stand-up even, um, more than wrestling. Uh, but we do also have Joe Warren coaching wrestling now, so we do have days where we do specify wrestling. But, I mean, literally I'm going everywhere with this one, this camp. Do you have lots of practices where someone like a Lance tries to take you down and you stop it, and does that, like, just boost your confidence when that does happen? <laughs> it does, but at the same time, I've been in the cage with Lance twice. I know how good his wrestling is compared to everyone else in the world. So I know I, there's, there's always a chance I need to get better. All right. Well, we're always rooting for you, my man. Um, it's great catching up with you. I'm glad you had a good off season, and good luck next Thursday. We'll be tuning in, and don't forget to get them taxes done, done my man. Don't don't pay any extra penalties or anything. You know, the, the object is to keep as much as that money as possible. It sounds good. I got my tax guy all over it. <laughs> that was his polite way of going. Shut the fuck up. I'm on. It. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Stephen. Take care, my man. You you're awesome, dude. Great talking awesome. to you. Hey, thanks, guys. All right, we'll see you. All right. Steven Seiler, PFL featherweight, fighting next Thursday. Tune in. ESPN 2 is where they'll start off, then they'll wind up on ESPN+. Plus. We're going to take our last break, and when we come back, we're going to knock off a few more of those uh, awards from the World MMA Awards. They are looming. It's coming up. MMA Junkie and one of our journalists is up for an award. We'll give you a reminder there, and then we'll cover a couple of the uh, different categories that's out there.
Good, you're still here. The boys are just getting warmed up. Now the real show begins. Take it away, boys. All right, so let me reset the stage here. Yesterday we were going over the World MMA Awards, www.worldmmaawards.com. It is voting season. We would appreciate your vote for best media source, MMA Junkies up against Bloody Elbow, MMA Fighting, Sure Dog, and Flow Sports. Flow Combat, to be more exact. John Morgan, one of our journalists, is also up. He's up against uh, Chuck Mendenhall, uh, Brad Okamoto, Ariel Hawani, and Kareem Zidane. We went over a, cu- a couple categories yesterday. We're going to knock off a few more today. And this is fun, man. It doesn't take that long to just click your vote and boom, support the World MMA Awards, support the sport. A lot of people really attend these awards, and it's a lot of fun. So uh, hopefully you all participate. Breakthrough fighter of the year goes. Diago Santos, Israel Adesanya, Anthony Smith, AJ McKee, Aaron Pico. Remember, these are the 2018. Okay, that makes it different. Yeah. Oh, man. I think the easy choice is Israel. Mm-hmm. But believe it or not, I'm going to go AJ McKee. See, I'm going to go with Israel because I interpret Breakthrough as someone who we didn't know much of, and he just broke through. Mm-hmm. Now, all these others were established, and they may have broken through and gotten, you know, became more of a contender or something like that. But I thought Israel just kind of came out of nowhere. We had the benefit of a guy named Lucas from New Zealand that listens to the show who told us about him. But, I mean, he had just had an incredible run in 2018. I'm going with him. I don't hate you. International Fighter of the Year. Uh, Habib Namagomedov, Kamaru Usman, Israel Adesanya, Gegard Mousasi, or Aung La Sang from one championship. Aung La. Nah, I'm just kidding. Uh, you got to go Habib, dude. I, a close second to me would be Kamaru just because of. Uh, he didn't capture the title to this year, though. The way he flies his banner, I think, is impressive. Okay. But uh, I go Habib. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Let's do one more. Fight of the Year. Robert Whitaker versus Joel Romero 2 at UFC 225. Thiago Santos versus Jimmy Manuel. Oh, that's tough. That was a good one. UFC 231. Douglas Lima versus Roy McDonald. Bell Tour 192. Good. Dustin Poirier versus Justin Gaethje. UFC on Fox 29. Tony Ferguson versus Anthony Pettis. UFC 229. I really enjoyed Pettis and Ferguson, but I think I'm going to go Gaethje Poirier. I'm with you. Really, Santos guys? and Manua hit each other so hard, though. Who are you going for? That I felt like they were just swinging baseball bats at Pettis. each other. Pettis? You gotta go Pettis? Pettis and Ferguson? It was Pettis good. Ferguson was a bloodbath, man. That was glorious. Yeah, yeah. well, so was Poirier and Gaethje, man. I wouldn't hate you. All these fights right were really, really good, but... Yeah, but Pettis uh, had that Superman punch kind of thing when he jumps off the cage. It was beautiful. All right. I well, ain't hating on you. They're, they're no, all great bad. fights. Yeah, they, they really are great they fights. They are. Knockout of the year. Yair Rodriguez versus Chan Sung Young, UFC Fight Night 139. Chris Cyborg versus Amanda Nunes, UFC 232. Mandel Nalo versus Carrington Banks. That was a good one, by the way. Bell tour 207. Vitor Belfort versus Lyoto Machida, UFC 224. Brian Ortega versus Frankie Edgar, UFC 222. Uh, this is knockout of the year. <sighs> I mean, when have you seen Chris Cyborg go down, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, at least with Frankie Edgar, you've seen him hurt pretty bad before. Mm-hmm. you you got to give it to Amanda Nunes on Chris Cyborg. Well, I just said you got to. You have no choice. I got to do it. All right. Amanda Nunes. But, no. but, 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 but. Yeah, your Rodriguez's elbow, dude. Was that the end? It kind of saved won, him. It won him the fight. It saved his relevance in the UFC. He wouldn't have gotten cut. But I think if he loses that, everybody went, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, get back in the line. Instead, he'll probably get a big high-profile fight. And this is their highest-profile fighter from Mexico. All right. But Nunes was spectacular because I'm not taking anything away from that. It's, 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 it's a one-two. It's a horse race between those two. I thought... Yair's was just more of a, can you believe what just happened? Mm-hmm. Amanda just lit her up from start to finish, and she did it against someone that we, we've never seen go down like that. 
So it was two different types of knockouts, both spectacular. It's all just in what you're looking for. But I, I would have no. I would stand in a pot for either one. I look at it this way: when people go, remember that elbow Yair had? I bet you half of the people won't remember who it was against. But when people go, do you remember when Cyborg knock, got knocked out? People right away would go, Amanda Nunes, I remember that. That's That was a deciding factor for me. All right, Andre keeps sending me texts, so let's just do this one. He's bugging me to do this one. Ring card girl of the year. Carly Woo! Baker, Jessica Andrade, Summer Daniels, Ariane Celeste, Mercedes Terrell. Look, they're all hot. We'll start with that. Mm -hmm. But who probably represents their their company or just seems to enjoy their job or or, or does their job the best? <sighs> Mercedes, Mercedes Terrell, guys. Yeah, Mercedes Terrell yeah. owns Instagram, George. If you want to post something on Instagram, you got to go through her. Mm -hmm. She owns it. You're you going make, with Mercedes? I'm going with Mercedes. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going with Jenny Andrade. Mercedes will probably get a little bit more love, except she hasn't been back to the studio since she used to live in Vegas. We need to get her back in studio. Um, Ariane is so popular. I just feel like she's got her mind on other stuff. I don't know too much about Summer Daniels. Uh, and Carly Baker does her job, but I, I don't see her that often. I just feel like Jenny's, like, immersed. Man, I think she's even got a UFC tattoo somewhere on her. But uh, She does. Yeah, and and, but she, she makes the time to visit the studio, so I'm, I'm partial there. All right, folks, we'll do some more categories tomorrow. And, again, quick reminder, MMA Junkie is up for Media Source of the Year. John Morgan's up for Journalist of the Year. Get in there and vote. It's, it's easy, www worldmmaawards.com. Big thanks to Steven Siler for his time. Thank you to Darren Kratz for his time. We'll be back in 22 hours with another edition of MMA Junkie Radio. For Andre and Goes, I'm George. Have a nice day and be a champion. <laughs>